This week on Extrax, malevolent AIs, porn nurse spies, everybody dies. It's the man versus machine episode. Welcome to Extrax, a podcast where we introduce each other to our fandoms one episode at a time. I'm your host, Aaron Klein, an X-Files spooky bitch. And I'm your other host, Scylla Cheeks, a slut for Star Trek The Original Series. Each podcast, we pick two episodes that fit a cinematic theme, watch them together, and then record our feelings. Our theme this week is Man vs. Machine. With our intrepid captain's love of monologuing computers to death, I had a whole smorgasbord to choose from. <laughs> but really, there is only one choice for this episode, and that's the season two episode, The Ultimate Computer. Not only do we get to see Kirk grapple with the fact that he, Captain James T. Kirk, may be replaced by a computer, but it's a classic story of efficiency versus human intuition. And while this is not strictly Shakespeare in space, the guest actor William Marshall gives a truly Shakespearean performance as computer engineer Dr. Richard Daystrom. Oh, and it's just a fucking great Mixed Burke episode. They're so supportive of their baby. I mean, Captain, whatever. It's everything I love in a classic Star Trek episode. And in this season five episode, Mulder and Scully fight a malevolent AI system bent on destruction while trying to wrangle with a woman who bases her entire makeup look on Blade Runner. It's Kill Switch! Also included in this episode is Mulder inside the internet experiencing a truly insane computer-based hallucination, where Scully kicks ass. <laughs> That's it. That's all the reasons. Computers! Computers! All right. Let's dig it in there, Mr. Spock. Okay. <laughs> there are certain things men must do to remain men. Your computer would take that away. There are other things a man like you might do. And now for a quick-ish episode summary. <laughs> <laughs> the Enterprise and her crew are summoned by Commodore Wesley without explanation. After arriving at a deep space station, the Commodore, who Kirk definitely banged at least once, <laughs> explains that the Enterprise, come on, he shows up and he's like, Bob, like, they <laughs> fucked, okay. <laughs> I know, demand Commodore Wesley, I know his human intuition. <laughs> yeah, they fucked, they 100%, fucked. at least once. Anyways... <laughs> Commodore Wesley explains that the Enterprise has been chosen as a test vessel for the M5 Multitronic System, a revolutionary tactical computer designed by the one and only Dr. Richard Daystrom. Hugh William Regal, it's War Games! War Games! If the test is successful, the M5 could potentially handle all of the ship's functions without human assistance. Spock is impressed by the potential science and efficiency of the computer, but Bones and Kirk have doubts. Just a niggling feeling in the back of the neck. A uh, red alert. At first, everything is peachy keen, and the M5 succeeds at performing ship functions more efficiently than a living crew. But soon, the M5 starts to exhibit troubling behavior, like turning off life support on unused decks to siphon off more power for itself. Dr. Daystrom, seemingly unable to view the M5 objectively, insists that the M5 is working properly. It's just learning. Not troubling at all. <laughs> As the M5 continues to succeed in the drills it performs, Kirk is jokingly referred to as Captain Dunsell, a Starfleet slang term for a part serving no useful purpose. Kirk is so upset by this accusation that he deadass just storms off the bridge without explanation, a true drama queen. <laughs> Dr. McCoy tries to soothe Kirk's woes with strong alcohol, some prescriptions never go out of style, but they are soon called back to the bridge when the M5 destroys an unmanned freighter. Concerned that the M5 just destroyed a ship with no provocation, Kirk orders Daystrom to shut the M5 down, but he won't, even after the M5 literally kills an ensign trying to disconnect the power source. Scotty and Spock also attempt to disable the computer, but are duped by the M5 as the M5 has rerouted all controls, including ship-to-ship -ship communications. Meanwhile, four of the Enterprise's sister ships approach to begin a new tactical drill unknowingly headed toward destruction. M5 sends a lethal attack towards the Lexington, killing 53, and then destroys the Excalibur, killing everyone on board. Unable to communicate with the Enterprise, Starfleet Command orders the remaining ships to destroy the Enterprise. Daystrom admits that he used his own human engrams to wire the M5, and as such, he tries to reason with the computer. But instead, he has a Shakespearean psychotic break and is forced into sickbay. Kirk, with only one last thing at his disposal, cracks his knuckles and talks that computer to death. <laughs> Once the M5 is disabled, Kirk orders Sulu to keep the shields down in the hopes that Commodore Wesley will realize that the Enterprise is no longer a threat. 
The gamble pays off and the Enterprise survives. Yay! Human intuition ultimately saves the day and all is right aboard the Enterprise. Inappropriate space laughter considering a bunch of people die. <laughs> he just really chuckles his way right out of that. Hello, hello. Uh, uh, this hello. guy's got to go into a mental institution. Hundreds of people died, but I'm still Captain Finger Guns. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what did you think of this episode? I really liked this Yay! episode. Yeah, I enjoyed this one a lot. I uh, love this episode. Yeah, this was really good. And like, I've seen Kirk talk a couple computers to death at it's this point. It's kind of his thing. He, As we've established, two tricks, talk a computer to death, sex magic. Yeah, that, those are his <laughs> tricks, and he's very good at both of them. Also, he did it very quickly in this episode. He was like, I have two questions for you. Why and why don't you kill yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the computer was like, fair points all around. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Uh, yeah i i really liked this episode i liked kirk having to grapple with the idea of losing his job to a machine like it's interesting also that in today 2021 this is something they were grappling with in the 60s that like man is going to be replaced by machine this is like an inevitability this is how we get to the pinnacle of human creation is that we outsource all of our jobs to machines yeah. and the like psychological reckoning that people have been having with that for 50 60 years is wild like that's it's funny too because i really liked i liked how mccoy and then also kirk were like well if they give my job to a computer like fuck that computer like there's no way a computer can do this job the way that i can because in the 60s that was something that was actively happening with the apollo missions that they i mean that's like the first use of a computer, like piloting without humans. And a bunch of the astronauts were like, I'm going to get up into space. I'm going to turn that fucking computer off. Like, I don't trust a computer to get me to the moon, but I know that I can do it. And it took a lot of time for those astronauts to come to terms with the fact that, like, actually, a computer can do this much safer than we can. But at the same time, something very similar happened when they were doing the moon landing, where where Neil Armstrong was like, we're not going to hit the ground right. And the computer can't tell that we could die from this landing because it's a computer who doesn't have the intuition that a human does and did actually have to turn the computer off and like manually navigate down to the landing spot. So I really like that this show is dealing with this right before there's a very real world application of this in the culture that this is existing inside of. So I really liked that. I thought that was cool, especially because like, this came out before that actually right. happened. Which is wild when you think about it. Yeah, because I was like, oh, this is interesting. I wonder if they're, oh, no, they can't possibly be referencing this thing because it's literally years before that. So I really like that. I thought that that's, I think it also points to the, like, prescience and the forward thinking of the writing that, like, they're very good at predicting this stuff. And, like, we talked about with the eugenics wars of the uh, wink 90s that, like, <laughs> they really, if you look at human history, you can predict a lot. Because if you pay attention, we're just cyclical beings. We do the same shit over and over forever and ever. And so I really like that this episode is like a good bottle and encapsulation of that. I also really like that they cast Daystrom as a black man. Yeah, it was a huge fucking deal, too. Yeah, like and, He I was mean, a really well-known actor, and it's like a huge deal that they cast him as like the this main character and a fucking genius. Like, yes, and this like, man got the Enterprise where, it, like, the computer's on the Enterprise and the computer's in Starfleet. And, like, the whole struggle with Daystrom is, like, he is a genius. He made this revolutionary discovery invention when he was only 24. And the rest of his life, he's been trying to live up to that. Like mm -hmm. like McCoy says, where do you go from up? Yeah, exactly. I really like that. And I like that they did a really good job of the reveal of him where he literally stands up and it's and like towers What's over up, Kirk? motherfuckers I'm a black man like I really like that I thought that that was really good for the 60s it's weird though because I also had to grapple with the fact that like he does kind of become the villain and so there's this like but he's this really sympathetic villain yes and I like too with the, that at the end he has this like you said very like Shakespearean breakdown of like what And he himself is talking about what it's like to experience knowing that your colleagues are laughing at you and telling you, like, well, it was just a fluke that you came up with this and, you, and you're just trying to prove over and over, like, no, I, I can do this. I am actually a genius, which I think makes more sense coming from a black actor, too, because that's something that he experiences in everyday life and 
black people still experience today of having to work twice as hard for half as much credit. Constantly prove yourself. Right, exactly. And so I thought that it was, it's very timeless casting. I think it, it aged extremely well. And I'm really glad that they went with that. And like, that's the whole thing with Star Trek is that it's very progressive. And there's a lot of like, quote unquote, race blind casting, but it's not really like it's clearly a commentary that they're using these specific actors. So I really enjoyed that. I thought that was really, really smart. Yeah. And you get to see the progression of his character, too, where he's presented as this brilliant scientist. Everybody knows who he is. Like they say his name. They're like, oh, Richard Daystrom. Like we all know who that is. Like He's a really big deal. And then you get to see him introduce his computer. And he's just like, yeah, I invented this computer. We're testing it. I'm very proud of it. But like, you know, casual, normal engineer. And then you see him kind of start talking about it like a child and Mm -hmm. like a a baby. Like this is my project or whatever. Like this is I put so much into it. And then you see him talking about it indistinguishable from himself. Like, yes, my invention is an extension of me literally because I put my brain engrams on it, but also because it is so intrinsically a part of me, which I feel like is really true to like creation writ large, whether you're a painter or a writer or a engineer or an inventor, like you put so much of yourself in it, it's almost impossible to like see it fail, especially when he's like, well, the M1 through four failed, but this one's not fucking failing. Yeah. I refuse to let it fail, even yes. when it literally kills a person in front of him, he's like, well, that was a mistake. We can fix it. We can still fix it. Like, Kirk literally has to, like, hold him back several times. Like, no, dude, this is failing. It's okay, but it is failing. And I think that progression really shows how how much... And I think that's why he's really a sympathetic villain, because you you see why he cares so much. And, and, And his whole point in creating it is... Not only to prove that he is still a genius and still can create something, but he's like, I'm doing it for the the greater good. Like, he genuinely yeah. believes that. Like, if we can have a starship that can man and operate without men, then, like, men won't have to die in space, but we'll still get all of this, like, good stuff from it. Like, I'm doing it to create and save life. And so then grappling with, like, oh, my my thing is murdering life. Yeah. But also this was meant to create it. And you see him grapple with it. And then you see the computer grapple with it because it's just a shadow of him. I think it's so fucking brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I really like, too, we were talking about this while we were watching the episode, that I like that the episode eventually grapples with the fact that he's like, oh, Kirk, you're just, like, upset because this computer's going to take over your job. And, like, Kirk has this great moment with McCoy where he's, like, actually interrogating his own feelings. Like, am I really just scared that I'm going to be made redundant? Do you think, as someone who knows my psychological profile, like... Am I just freaking out about this or like is my intuition right here? Which right. ultimately like like only a fool would stand the way of progress. Am I a fool? And like the greater message of the episode is that intuition is sometimes better than the logic, quote unquote, of a computer. So I like that you get this like preview, this like foreshadowing of that. And then that that also grows into Daystrom like having himself to grapple with this invention means everything to me and if it fails it reflects on me in this very negative way and as he has his breakdown it's like everyone thinks that I'm a fluke and I refuse to allow myself to be thought of that way and so I like that you get these like very multi-layered internal probings of why do I feel the way that I feel Mm -hmm. and again for the 60s that's so surprising especially to see men grappling with that like really existential question of am I necessary and are the things that I contribute good? And does this make the world a better place? Like that's still something that people in general, but especially men are told like, don't (laughs) like you're just essential. Don't even worry about it. And so to see this like very deep thinking about who they are as people and what they've done and what they'll continue to do. I just really liked, and I think it's done really, really well. Like, I just think this episode is super well written. And I just enjoyed so much of it. I love that you see, too, because this is season two. Like, we last episode, we watched Arena, which was really early on in Trek. And we get this kind of trigger happy Kirk who, like, not necessarily, I don't say trigger happy necessarily in terms of war, but in terms of like, I'm making a decision. I'm not interrogating anything. I'm following my intuition. This is the right move. And then as he gets more information and whatever, he interrogates himself and then makes like a more moral decision but in season two and this is like later in season two because this is season two episode 24 and I think there's only 26 episodes in season two but it's late season two you see this huge character growth in Kirk already where he immediately is like okay 
I'm going to interrogate this because I'm feeling bad about this. I think that this computer is wrong, not only because it's replacing me, but I think there's something wrong about it. And I love that he has this conversation with McCoy, but I just also think it shows such incredible character growth of Kirk. And you do see that going forward and you see it in movies, too, where he's like, am I being an asshole because I just want to be a captain again? And sometimes the answer is yes. But sometimes the answer is no, you need to take control because everybody else is making a shit decision. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that he continuously has this conversation with himself and with his best friends slash lovers or husbands or whatever. But like, it's such huge character growth just between one season. Yeah, I totally agree. And I really like too that this is ultimately about like intuition versus the logic of a computer And, like, today we understand better, like, computers aren't non-biased. They're programmed by humans. They have human bias. Like, their logic, quote-unquote, is designed by humans who have bias that means that those decisions are not always logical. And I like that in the end of this we see that. Like, this is a human who programmed it to think like a human, which means it makes illogical decisions. And, like, I just really love that. And, again, for the 60s especially, it's just such forward-thinking writing about how to grapple with the idea of machines. It's just so smart. I just really like it. I also like that you... So we have Kirk, who's kind of the center of this. Like, will this computer replace him? He's, like, dealing with that, but he's still trying to be a good captain, whatever. He's kind of the pivotal point. But then we have these three characters around him where we have Bones, who is like, fuck that, no way, I don't trust machines, nope, 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 McCoy, absolutely not human beings over machines. And then we see the polar opposite of... Dr. Richard Daystrom being like, no, machines can replace everybody. Like, that's machines are the best. (laughs) Like, machines, machines, machines. And then we see, ironically, this middle point of Spock where, like, Kirk and Bones are kind of, like, poking fun at him. I'm like, oh, yeah, you love computers, right? And Spock is literally like, yes, this computer is efficient. But the most important thing that we need to remember is that computers help us and they are good servants and help us do our jobs better. But, like, they shouldn't replace us. Like, Mm -hmm. we should work in tandem with each other, like human beings and computers. Like we need to live in harmony. That's how, you know, we will have the most efficient use of our time and whatever. And I think that is something that we are still grappling with today. Like there are people, bosses, capitalists who are like, well, it's cheaper and quote, more efficient to do, to just mechanize everything. But in the long run, is it cheaper and more efficient when it breaks down or makes stupid decisions? And like, You shouldn't just full stop replace people. You shouldn't just say no machines ever. Like there has to be a balancing act. Like that's what progress is like balancing, learning, working together, not just like, nope, fuck it. We're going to replace it. And like there needs to be a human who can use their intuition to say like, this is not working. Right. The Neil Armstrong example you gave is like the perfect example. Like this computer got us to space safely. But in this moment, I as a human can see this is not going to work. I need to turn this off and make a split decision, which is like... It needs, it has to be both. Yeah. And like the idea that like they talk about on the bridge, the computer can make decisions faster than a human, but does that make them right? Right. Like just because it can perform a function faster, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right function that it should be performing, especially when it starts shooting down ships and they're like, we literally can't stop it. What the fuck are we supposed to do? Like being able to give it that human control and give it a literal off switch is really important, especially as you're- uh, kill uh, A kill switch? A kill switch? Especially as you're developing technology. And like, it's a mistake to think technology is perfect right away because it's not like as he even said like one through four failed and like there's no reason five can't fail it's just and, doing better than one through four like this was yeah. supposed to be a test yeah it's supposed to be a test and bone says later too like the government bought this technology from him and so he has to make this work like i think that that's also a really good like view of what happens today where it's like because of capitalism and like, oh, efficiency, let's bow down to the God of efficiency and cheapness. Like, oh, it's work. We can see that this will work. And so we're just going to buy it now and just make it work now. And it's like, that's not how this this always fucking works. And like Daystrom says at one point, like, you don't turn a trial off when it makes a mistake, but like you do, you should, especially when you're. We don't turn the child off. You're just like, yeah, but hey, like, let's talk about it. <laughs> but you do. Like, if a child is performing a function and you're like, you're doing something that's dangerous, you don't just let them keep right. doing it. I'm just saying you don't murder them. Well, yes, you <laughs> you're don't like, just kill time the... to turn this child off. <laughs> well, 
yes, that's true. <laughs> but if they had given the option of let them interact with the M5 and allow for them to be like, no, scale back what you're doing, only control these functions, that's a better way to deal with that as opposed to just like, run fucking wild, toddler, you can run this ship if you want. And like, have again, learning to live in harmony with that is a way more efficient way to work with those programs as opposed to just have at it, good luck, and... Thanks for all the fish, I guess. Like that's <laughs> It's just not a smart way to do that. Also, we get one of my favorite uh, low-level ships in this. Get to see Scotty and Spock working together <laughs> in a little tube. You love them so much. I do. I love that they're both very smart, very capable, and like f- are so dedicated to making their jobs work. And so I love it when they have to work together to fix a problem that's going on with a ship. Like, we've obviously seen, like, transporter ships or whatever. But seeing them, like, crawl up into a tube and be like, we are going to make this work. Like, I just love that. It's, I don't even want to watch them make out in this situation. I'm just like, ooh, it's bros working together on a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I love how much you love them. It's so great. I do love the low level, the, like, secondary storyline of this episode is McCoy and Spock like gassing up Kirk (laughs) like being really sweet and supportive and being like hey we're on your side like we're we believe in James T. Kirk like this computer can be the best thing in the world but like there is loyalty here and we care about you and we also know because we've worked with you we know that you are going to be a better captain than this fucking machine like so but they're being very like delicate with him and it's Really sweet. It's very <laughs> sweet. I love that Spock has that line about like a starship is also built on loyalty. And that's something that we see constantly over TOS, especially when the crew is going off of the ship and then has to make those decisions. Like that stuff is important. And the loyalty that we see over and over, like sometimes the good of the one is more important than the many because the one benefits the many in a way that you can't just replace. Like right. people aren't just completely disposable and replaceable in a way that a machine views them because machines can literally be replaced. And so they just don't have that empathy. I also thought it was interesting too. This wasn't something they really like addressed at the end, but when they take the shields down and they allow the other captain to realize Bob, Bob they realize <laughs> Bob makes the decision, like, ah, Kirk, only Kirk would think to do this. <laughs> like, I I thought at first that what they were doing was teaching the M5 about mercy and the quality. They turned that fucking machine off. Well, yeah, they turn it off, but it still exists inside of that. And so it's, I, I thought at first that that's what was happening, is that they're teaching this, like, the quality of mercy is just as important as the quality of logic and like I wish that they would have gone into that a little more probably because we just watched Arena where like that's a big part of it literally like ah mercy ah yes you're an advanced civilization because you understand mercy and like oh if only we could teach computers about empathy and mercy like that seems like the next step in AI evolution they just weren't there yet (laughs) like that's okay they'll get there eventually so I yeah I just really really liked this and of course I was very pleased when uh, Spones was flirting in the elevator and Kirk's like they're my boys and just like and we're back to normal here we go (laughs) space laughter we did kill an entire ship Anyways, (laughs) Anyways, <laughs> whoops a doodle. Yeah, so I think a really interesting thing about this episode, especially considering how well written it is, it is another one of those episodes where somebody not on staff wrote it. So this was the idea, at least for this, the original story was by mathematician Lawrence N. Wolf. He came up with this idea based on the, his fascination with computers. Like it said that he gave this teleplay or this story idea to Ray Bradbury, who gave it to Gene really? Roddenberry, and then was like, "Hey, can somebody do something with this?" And then DC Fontana, who is like the main female writer, wrote it. Which I think you can always tell when she writes something because she writes really nuanced men interrogating their own yes. feelings. <laughs> <laughs> like she's yeah. so fucking good. But I love like we had we watched. Is there in truth no beauty? Good job. <laughs> Thank you. A couple weeks ago. And I just think like those that episode and then this one are honestly two of my favorite episodes because I think they're really nuanced and mm-hmm. incredible. And I, I just think it's fucking so cool as somebody who like loves fandom and stuff that 
they were ostensibly written by two people who are just like, I like the show. I like Star Trek. I think this would be a really good Star Trek like episode. And they were like, hell fucking yeah, this is really good. Yeah, it's like someone watching the show and being like, I know what this show is about. Yeah. And like, this feels like an episode that knows what Star Trek is about. Absolutely. And I just really liked that. Jimmy Doohan is the voice of the computer, obviously. <laughs> that man is the voice of everything. That man loves to voice act. He's fucking great. He's like, yo, cut me a check. Cut me 30 checks. <laughs> I'm ready. All the checks. There is a line with uh, Spock and Bones kind of at the beginning where Spock's like, it's a shame that they don't have technology to replace you yet, Doctor. And then as somebody who has watched a lot of the rest of Star Trek, so in Voyager, they get thrown into you know, whatever, the Delta Quadrant, and their doctor dies, and they have to activate the EMH, which is the emergency medical hologram. Oh. <laughs> so in the future, there does exist, like, that technology, but it's meant to be an assistant. It's not right. meant to be the main doctor. And they're like, hey, so we're in the Delta Quadrant, and the doctor's dead. You got to be the main doctor now. And the EMH is like, what the fuck? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm a fucking hologram. And so all of Voyager is him being like, I guess. <laughs> Just figure it out. I love that. That's, and I'm, he has such an acerbic like, quality, too. Like, my kingdom for Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy to me an EMH. It would be <laughs> the whole universe would fucking collapse in on itself. That fanfic has to exist. I just want them, like, angrily talking at each other. Oh, I don't need them to fuck. I'm yeah. just like, give me a friendship fic about them, like, duking it out about, like, which one of us is better at this? And the MH was like, you, you're better at this. <laughs> but also, I have some theories. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really, I think that's such a, my favorite thing is, like, here are some seeds or whatever in TOS and see how it has grown throughout all of the, like, 800 episodes of Star Trek. And I think that that's really, like, a fun thing to be like, ugh, wish we could replace you. In the future, we kind of can. Yeah. <laughs> but they also choose not to. It's, like, meant to right. be an assistant. Also because of the image. I mean, they figure it out and stuff, but, like, it's a hologram. It, like, needs lights and shit. So right. it's just fascinating to quote. I'm sorry. To quote Spock, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you fucking use Don't. the word fascinating. <laughs> it's interesting. Don't you fucking use uh, it. <laughs> Kirk in this episode recites a line from the poem Sea Fever. I mean, it's a big thing that I love when Kirk is like, let me show you how literary and nerdy I am. But also, he quotes that poem in Star Trek V, my favorite Star Trek movie. So just a shout out for The Final Frontier in fact. <laughs> also, in this episode, he's wise the computer several times. Also, wise God. Anyways, watch that movie. That's my platform. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. So while I was watching this episode to prepare for this, when... William Marshall, who plays Richard Daystrom, is like having that heart to heart or whatever with the computer. And it's like, I am great. You're great. And he's having this big emotional moment. Me, as a big Shakespearean nerd, was like, this man has to have been Othello, right? Because he, that speech Must. is also a very Othello speech, yes. right? Like him, like kind of talking to the gods, but also having a conversation with himself and like, am I the bad guy? No, I'm not the bad guy. I'm making the right decision. And it was just like a very Shakespearean, like specifically Othello speech, not only because this is like a prominent black actor. I Googled it. He played Othello like eight times. Of course. Yeah. And was actually known. Harold Hobson of the London Sunday Times praised Marshall's portrayal as the best Othello of our time. So not only was he Othello a bunch, he fucking nailed it. And I, yeah. I love that, like, I was just like, yeah, this guy's incredible. I would pay so much money to see him be Othello. Yeah. He's, it, it, that, like, the consequences of my own actions and having to grapple with. Yeah, totally. Am I the bad guy? Like, absolutely. Totally. I can 100% see that. I just, I think he's such, he's such incredible casting, not only... For all the reasons you said, but he's such like a powerful actor. And honestly, the visual element of him being so much taller yeah. than like Kirk and even Nimoy, who is quite like tall, at least on the like visually on the ship. Like it's just such a powerful choice. Even mm -hmm. the like purple and orange he wears, like I just think he's incredible. And this episode rules. And I'm really glad that you liked it. Yeah. Yep. I did. I liked it a lot. Are you ready for a synopsis showdown? I am. A genius scientist tries to reclaim the clout of his youth by installing a supercomputer meant to replace the men on the Enterprise. Oh, yes. On James, the T stands for the fuck this computer doing on my ship, Kirk's Enterprise. Needless to say, it does not go well for the computer. <laughs> <laughs>
A machine is brought on board the Enterprise to make the crew redundant. Surprise, though! It acts like a human and will do anything to protect itself, including murder! Kirk efficiently talks it into killing itself, yada yada yada, space flirting, space laughter! <laughs> I love that the, the Kirk's two things are, can I trick them with my dick? Can I talk this computer to death? That's <laughs> it. I will make this computer <laughs> kill itself. <laughs> I get two tricks. Uh. <laughs> Are you ready for Scully? It's me. I am. Scully! Scully, Scully help! Scully help! Scully help! Jobs and Wozniak and Apple. Gates and Allen writing basic. The homebrew computer club's first meetings. Gelman was there. Now they're power brokers and billionaires. All right, a quick-ish summary. Godspeed. <laughs> The episode opens with a man trying to access a computer program and sweating profusely in a diner, slowly filling with criminals, both the police and gang variety. Suddenly there's a shootout and everyone's dead. When called in to identify the drug dealers, Mulder recognizes the sweaty man, because of course he does, as a Silicon Valley folk hero, because it's the 90s, <laughs> who worked with computers. Mulder naturally steals the computer and disc he was trying to access and immediately puts it into his car stereo because he does not fear death. Then they take the disc to the lone gunman who tell them it's full of data, but they don't have the capability to crack the code. Scully, ever pragmatic, says, maybe we should check his email, where they find a message from Invisigoth saying that someone named David is missing. They trace the message to a shipping container where Invisigoth, a woman with Blade Runner inspired makeup, tasers the shit out of Mulder and is ultimately captured by Scully, who she also tasers three separate times. But Scully's like, not on my fucking watch, bitch. I will shoot you. <laughs> They discover that her shipping container is full of computer equipment, but uh uh-oh, it's about to be blown to hell by a particle beam missile. They all escape in the car just in time, despite Scully's best efforts to be blown to shit. (laughs) They take Blood Runner Goth back to the Lone Gunman, where she reveals that they have created an AI who is hunting down its perceived enemies, its creators. And the disc Mulder stole is actually a kill switch virus that can destroy the AI. Invisiblade, Goth, whatever... (laughs) Kidnaps, <laughs> kidnaps Scully and forces her. Can you tell I do not like her makeup. Kidnaps Scully and forces her to take her to David's trailer. Psych! It's also been destroyed. And Visigoth reveals that she and David were in love and were planning to transfer their consciousnesses to a virtual reality world where they could be intertwined forever. Sounds like hell. Ugh. Meanwhile, Mulder has found the trailer where the AI is stored along with David's dead ass body and he is promptly overpowered by the AI where they run him through a computer simulation that makes him think that horny nurses are chopping his arms and legs off. In his dream state, he is rescued by a karate badass Scully who tries to get him to reveal the location of the kill switch and oh my god, it was all a dream, I'm a kicker in the chest. Scully and Invisigoth take the computer that supposedly has the kill switch on it to a bridge and yeet it away where it's destroyed by another particle missile. They then find Mulder and rescue him from the AI where Invisigoth reveals, psych, I actually had the kill switch in my pants all along. And she's going to upload it to a computer and her brain and also another particle missile so that she and her boyfriend can be together forever. Scully, because she's not a bitch, uploads it herself, and the particle missile is on its way to kill them, and she rescues Mulder's dumbass body once again. We see that maybe the AI is maybe smarter than they thought, because it definitely has another trailer. Anyway, the end. Hope this never comes back to bite them in the ass. How did you feel about this episode? Sidebar, before we start, I find myself wanting to do full, like, radio fully during your summaries, (laughs) because you go, like, light fucking speed, which is really impressive, honestly. Like, Bobby has to edit mine heavily, because I have several breakdowns, and, like, I really just want to do, like, full, like, slide whistles and shit (laughs) during your, because, like, it deserves... Sound effects. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How did I feel about this episode? I thought this episode was really good. I had a good time. Good. I'm I glad. like, what's this, season five? Season five. Season yeah. five seems very good. Yeah, season five <laughs> is very good. <laughs> I thought I thought it was really interesting how they dealt with the computer stuff, especially considering it was the 90s. Like, obviously, like, we have very advanced, like, shockingly advanced technology now. But in the 90s, like, internet was still kind of new. And, like, people didn't really know what was up. Like, we talk about all the time, like, part of, like, X-Files fandom was, like, this is one of the first shows that we can kind of, like, be on the internet and talk about it together. So to do a whole episode, like, based on this and kind of, like, Whoa, what it would happen if we had some like primordial ooze on the internet? I thought was really interesting. I also thought they did a good job. Sometimes this annoys me when TV shows do this, but I thought they did a good job of being like, yeah, this dude that's clearly made up, but 
he also exists in this world like Bill Gates and stuff. Mm-hmm. And like I loved how like fanboy the lone gunmen were for him. They're like, oh, this guy. And then when they find out that he's dead, they like all just look like they want to fucking cry. Yeah, but they're like, like real sad keeping moment. it together. Like, oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. Heavy casualty. <laughs> Heavy casualties. I also love the, like, trope of this episode of Mulder, like, fucking off on his own, totally, like, getting, like, he would have died if Scully oh, yeah. hadn't come and rescued him. We have this, like, really interesting back and forth between Invisigoth. <laughs> so stupid. It's gonna Esther. Call her Esther. <laughs> Esther. Which Scully is all too happy to do the rest of the episode. <laughs> yeah, right? Esther and Scully were, like, they fucking hate each other from the get, but then they, like, wor- learn how to, like, begrudgingly work together which I think that this is handled really well because on one hand it could just be like uh bitches hating each other like just being bitches yeah two competent women can't be in the same room together like impossible (laughs) but then they as they learn as Scully specifically learns more about Esther and like what's going on and starts to believe begrudgingly (laughs) like the Scully story (laughs) the Scully way (laughs) she has a lot more like empathy and sympathy for her but then ultimately is like bitch you want to die then you can die I'm gonna get this dumb hoe into the forest like I cannot be your like your babysitter goodbye yes absolutely Esther says at one point, you don't listen, do you? And like, she's Scully like, literally Bye. is like, goodbye. Yeah. She's like, oh, you want to die in here? Good luck. <laughs> Godspeed, my friend. <laughs> Later. <laughs> I thought their their dynamic was really, really interesting. I like that a lot. I also like that in the 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 idea that they're like, we're talking about Bill Gates and like Silicon Valley and stuff. Silicon Valley, which is known to be like a gross ass boys club to have the main character that we're dealing with be a woman and be like a be a super competent but also famous woman like the the lone gunman not only do they like kind of trip over themselves because she's very beautiful but because they're like holy shit you're like esther whatever whatever you're fucking genius you're like a god to us like also bangable but also holy shit your brain (laughs) yeah yeah they like they talk about her accomplishments and then fro hickey is like right she's so hot and it's like do you think she's hot because you want to fuck her brain or her vagina and like maybe both and that's cool i like why not both (laughs) (laughs) but i like that a lot like I like we see the one guy. What's his name? Like Donald or whatever. Yeah, the, I don't know. the sweaty guy in the diamond. Yeah, it's Donald. We see him and him kind of talking to himself, but he dies like right away. And then the other guy is already dead. Like mm-hmm. we know that they're like you know they were a trio and they're all brilliant and smart. But like we really only deal with her. And I really like that. I yeah. like that we in the boys club of Silicon Valley and of tech shit. Like no, she is one of the smartest people in the world, mm-hmm. and we are dealing with her. That is great. Her dumb makeup. <laughs> so stupid. So stupid. But I mean, if you were living in a shipping container, why not? I guess. Sure. Also, you can only get away with that type of makeup if you have perfect skin. So like. That's true. Go for it. Yeah, that's true. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. You could also imagine that she put it on nicely, but then she was just hot in the shipping container and just like melted. And then she like cries it off. <laughs> yeah. And then it gets real gothy and dramatic when she cries. I like it when she cries it off. Me it's too. Like, this is how your makeup should look. We don't need these perfectly round goggle circles. That's unnecessary. <laughs> cyberpunk <laughs> there's a lot of good really Mulder and scully stuff too i love the like when he takes the the computer and she's like Mulder, that's evidence he's like gee i hope so yes <laughs> <laughs> or when she like s- like swerves off and gets out and he's like so are we having a temper right now? yeah she's so mad and he's so pleased he's <laughs> so happy about it he reacts to her having emotion in the same way that McCoy reacts to Spock having emotion where it's yeah. like, oh, are we a little ice princess? Do we not have emotions? <laughs> <laughs> I really love that. And I also love it. Like, even in Mulder's fucking, like, nightmare dream, he's like, I need my doctor. I need Dr. Scully. I need Dr. Scully. And then envisions her as, like, a badass, like, coming to save him. Like, he's the princess. She's the, like, yes. warrior. Like, I love that. Like, that is perfect. Also love Scully just, like... Double tapping everything. She's like, you run from me, I'm going to shoot you. Bam, bam. Like, I didn't hit you on purpose, but I will shoot you. The alarm goes off. She shoots it, shoots a little robot right in the stupid fucking face without like looking. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. This woman with a gun. Dana Scully, not afraid to shoot you. <laughs> not afraid to shoot you. Oh, yeah. she. I, I've looked it up before, but she has, like, a body count of, like, hundreds over the course of the series. Like, Yikes. she will shoot anybody fucking dead. It's like, you know, she never forgets she is a cop. <laughs> like, yeah, she's, she's ready to shoot at any moment. <laughs> she's ready. She's defense. 
Yeah, I think this is a really good balance of like what an X Files, like a successful X Files episode is to me. Like you do have the kind of like monster of the week element, but it's also really interesting and very prescient of the time. I, though I think like the idea of what is, what do we get from the internet? Like how does it grow? Especially like in 2021, where like it is primordial news <laughs> in yes. many ways, but it's also like this incredible tool where it connects people and can be a really big force for good, but it can also be this really destructive thing. And like, Mm -hmm. we kind of don't know how to control it, even though the internet is not to our knowledge, like sentient or whatever, like we still don't really know how to control it or interact with it. And like that media literacy is not really taught or learned, or you have to kind of just figure it out on your own, which is interesting when you think about this episode that came out in the nineties and you're like, the internet's coming to attack us because it's fucking sentient, but it's like, what well, doesn't even need to be sentient. Like, we yeah. just kind of don't know how to deal with it. Like, Scully, who is, like, super brilliant and smart, doesn't really... Uh, she's like, yeah, I checked my email and shit, but like, I'm not, like, a hacker or whatever. We have to go to this bunker with these, like, losers. And they're like, <laughs> I don't know. We'll figure it out. Like, yeah. I think that's really uh, an interesting thing that we still have to grapple with. And this does, like, a good job of that. And also, like, Silicon Valley still being, like, a dumb boys club. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I really like this episode. This is one of those episodes that I like. I forget how much I like it. It's really fun. Yeah, it is really fun. It's, I, it's not funny, but it has funny moments. Mm-hmm. And it like, like the the nightmare porn stuff is like not funny, but also, but it also like really works with Mulder's character, especially yes. like, I don't necessarily know. Like, I think this episode would be fine on its own, but I think this is one of those episodes that like is better if you know more about their characters. Like, you yes. know, like, Mulder's weird porn stuff and how he he views Scully right. and how Scully like views how she interacts with like things that she can't understand and how it takes her literally like the whole episode and almost dying before she's like reluctantly maybe yeah. and like but she's still willing to like go to bat for people I think yeah I think this episode is really really fun and really good for their characters and could you could watch and probably get enjoyment out of if you haven't seen it but also it it helps if you have like basis for their characters it's not quite as meta as some of the other ones where you like really need to know these characters but i think you're right i think that it it really benefits from being in season five and us like knowing a lot about the way that Mulder and scully specifically interact with each other and like the fact that she has to constantly save his dumb ass and like he gets that he like understands i need scully very badly otherwise i will constantly die and but he also understands too like she needs me i was just gonna say that like she like the when the rocket or whatever is coming to him he's like scully we have to go and she's like oh god whatever and they almost fucking die because she really doesn't want to believe and she has to be told and shown so many ways like they are a true partnership where like she needs him or he needs her to literally save his life, but she needs him to like genuinely broaden her horizon. Cause she is like, uh, you know, she comes from a very Christian, like Mm -hmm. I'm assuming some conservative background. She's like very like at the beginning of the series, like I am an FBI agent. I am a doctor. Here's my path or whatever. And like without Mulder, she probably would have had a really boring traditional career. And he's like, no, you gotta look at things you know, you're smart. Be smart. Yeah. And he has to kind of remind her sometimes, like, no, just use your eyes and your brain. Come on, you're smart. Right. Yeah. And, like, he helps her grapple with the ethics of, like, Mulder, that's evidence. We should have given it up. And he's like, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> we should definitely not give this to people who Stop can't being figure- such a cop, Scully. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Mulder's like, I hate the feds. Fuck the feds. I don't give a shit. I will fuck shit up. <laughs> I don't give a damn about my reputation. And Scully's like, um, maybe you should care, like, a little bit more. And he's like, nah, I don't think that I should, actually. Hey, do you know any feds? And he's like, oh, me. Oh, I'm a fed. I'm a- <laughs> it literally I'm takes him a second. Like, oh. I do. I, I can look up where those things are because I'm a fan. <laughs> uh, that's one of the, just as like a side note, that's one of my favorite things about Mulder is that he like does not understand the power that he holds as an FBI agent. Like, yeah. He they, truly views himself as this like underdog and he is in some ways, but he's also like not. He's a cop. He is actually, he could flash his badge wherever he fucking wants. And like Morris Fletcher really hits that on the head where he's like, I just flash my badge and I can do whatever the fuck I want. Like immediately. And Mulder like does not know how to grapple with the fact that like, I am an FBI agent. I get a lot of say and a lot of space to do stuff because I can just say I need it and people will give it to me. 
but he like constantly grapples with that, which I find a, is a an interesting arc to his character over the whole series. So this episode was written by William Gibson, who is famous for writing cyberpunk. He's the inventor of cyberpunk. So nice. like, obviously that makes a lot of sense. He wrote this with fellow science fiction writer Tom Maddox. They were longtime friends who would discuss various different kinds of collaborations before they, they approached the production company and were like, yo, can we write an episode for this? Maybe we would really like to do that. And a huge part of that is because Gibson started watching this series because his daughter, who was 15 years old at the time, was a huge X-Files fan. It was like, maybe you should try to write for this show. And then they spent like the majority of filming on set because he brought his daughter with him, who was Cute. so excited to be so there. So punk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he said, I we spent a lot of time on the set because my daughter insisted on being there. And like, I love that. I think that that's great. Also, is just like, I love dad-daughter stuff. I love when dads support what their daughter's like. And especially when it's a daughter who's like, you know what I fucking love? Mulder and Scully. And and fucking science it. fiction. Yes, and like exactly. a non-traditional, like, I mean, more so now, but like, even in the 90s, a, like a young girl, 15-year-old yes. being like, I love sci-fi. Like, it's yes. kind of a boys club. And like, for mm-hmm. her dad who is like a sci-fi cyberpunk to be like, hell fucking yeah, let's go. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Yeah, I love that. I think it's really great. This episode deals with a lot of Gibson's themes that he uses a lot, like alienation, paranoia, and the will to survive inside of, like, a ever dystopic world, <laughs> which, like, yeah, <laughs> that's this whole episode is about how do we survive? Do we need to be human? What is a human? Can we upload our consciousness and exist together in this way to survive? Yeah. Like, I, I feel love- like if she had presented it as, like, oh, but to be uploaded and, and live forever and, like, you know, have all of knowledge at my fingertips, I may have been, like, okay I see that argument but she was like no I want to upload so I can mingle with this other person forever and never be apart completely without human fo- both of us were like ugh hard pass yeah I went gross <laughs> yeah. you were like ugh yeah. at the same time <laughs> I'm like no no thank you both of us happily married and we're like god no mix our personalities completely with our yeah. husband <laughs> no thank you or anybody <laughs> for real no like, thanks a temporary mind melt sure maybe a forever like computer amalgamation stuck in cyberspace <laughs> no no way being stuck together in an apartment during the pandemic was As hard know, enough i don't want to be physically stuck with anything it's not terrifying <laughs> <laughs> it's my number one fear apparently uh. This episode also revolves around the very Gibsonian ideas of interactions of human and artificial intelligence, especially on the World Wide Web as the, and the net, as they call it, like a hundred times during this episode. And these ideas were really popular in the 90s when this was written as well. Again, like I said, the Internet's really new. And so this idea of, like, what can we do with the Internet? Like, I think it's interesting to watch the... Star Trek episode where they're talking about computers and like what it means to be a computer and can a computer replace a human? Can a computer be a human? And this is about the internet and like the capability that computers give us to be a part of this primordial ooze, this web, yeah, where we're interconnected to all of these other humans, but to technology too that we cannot control and that can control us in many ways too. So I really like that. And I like makes a lot of sense to me why, especially in the 90s, this was so popular. Also, like, science fiction, modern science fiction, and also, like, paranormal shit love just having fucking hackers. I can just be like, oh, oh yeah. I can do it. Yeah. And I said okay. while we were watching it, too, I appreciate that Donald, at the beginning, is in a suit. And he's not in, like, computer hacker gear. He's not in, like, a hoodie in a diner. Like, he just looks like a dude. I appreciate that his computer is duct taped together. Yeah. Like, very cyberpunk. <laughs> the one thing that will survive past all of us is duct tape. So I appreciate that very good detail. Apparently, it took over a year for this episode to be written and completed, mostly because Chris Carter and Frank Spotnitz were like, we have other priorities. Would you imagine saying that to William Gibson? Like, ah, we'll get to you eventually. <laughs> Hang loose, dude. See you later. I'll be at the beach. Which <laughs> is just like absolutely hilarious to me. But one of the things, too, that when they like finally got together to like, okay, we're going to, this is the episode we're going to do. We're going to put it together. One of the huge things, which Bobby talked about while we were watching this, is that the main thing that Chris Carter and Spotnitz did was make revisions to the script, making Esther's character more of a bitch <laughs> and making the way that Mulder and Scully interact to her more of the way that it is now which like you said really contributes to this episode like 
it is those human characteristics working together that make this such a strong episode. Especially not only the like female versus female thing, but like Esther is like a cyberpunk and she got invaded. Her bunker got invaded by the feds. Why would she fucking trust them? Yeah. And like normally I would be like, ugh, I roll like pitting two women against each other. But like their personalities make sense. Like it makes yeah. sense why they butt heads. And then even how they work together, like even when they start to reluctantly work together, they still kind of butt heads or whatever, but they do have this empathy and stuff for each other. And I feel like instead of it feeling like, uh, bitches can't be getting along. It does feel very genuine to the character that we know of Scully, but also like this like quick character that we get of Esther. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. This episode, in addition to taking a year to finally get together, had a lot of weird delays because they had to get permission for Esther to throw that laptop off of the bridge. And it took them 30 days to get a permit in order to do it because that area is protected. And huh. so they like... They were like, no, this is really important. We don't want to CGI this computer. We're going we to CGI this particle beam. So we really want her to yeet this computer in. And they, like, took the time to get that permit. Something, you know, they love to skirt around doing stuff. So I'm glad they took the time to do it. Did they fish it out? I don't know. I'm not sure if that's part of why they got a permit is because they had to leave this computer in this fucking river. I don't know. I couldn't find that information. I hope so. I hope they just left it down there and they were like, it'll be fine. <laughs> it's just a prop. It'll be fine. <laughs> this episode was the most expensive episode the show produced during its entire run in Vancouver, which is the first five seasons, which is more, more expensive than the elephant. Yes. <laughs> The most expensive one. Because <laughs> of all the explosions. Yes. Mm -hmm. It took 22 days for them to film this, which is an insane amount of time for a television show. Like, like 45 minutes. Right, exactly. The city rescinded its permission for them to film in for lots of reasons. I'm sure they were like, uh, you're lighting a lot of shit on fire. I'm not so sure about this. X-Files special effects crew shipped as many containers as they could to a recycling center that was in the adjacent city of Burnaby where they filmed the explosion, quote unquote, without a hitch. So like, suck at local laws. Their favorite thing to do is to go around those laws. The destruction of the trailer, where they, you know, start a fucking forest fire. <laughs> they filmed it adjacent to the Burnaby Bay Airport. And afterwards, the series received several complaints from people living around that airport, complaining about the explosion and the resultant shockwave that it sent off. So like... Not great. <laughs> Not great that they, like, I appreciate that they wanted to do the practical effect of it. And we're like, we just can't get the same effect if we try to CGI this. But also, like, maybe evacuate the area around you. The yeah, place maybe you're give in. everybody a heads up so yeah. they don't get tinnitus. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe we should have done that. The robot that attacked Mulder inside of the trailer is based on the Sojourner rover, and it cost $23,000 to create. So, like, another reason this is a very expensive episode. Why didn't they just, like, go to high school and be like, can we have one of your, like, fighting robots that you, like, beat each other up with? Can we just have one of those real quick? I mean, it's the 90s. <laughs> what are those called? BattleBots? It's BattleBots. I was super into BattleBots. Go and follow the BattleBots TikTok. It's dope as shit. <laughs> BattleBots rules. Yeah. BattleBots is super fucking cool. They hired a freelance computer artist to generate a 3D image of Scully for that scene where she's fighting the group of nurses and she like flashes, which is so wild to me. Like, it's a very brief shot, but they were like, no, we need to make sure that we have a 3D Scully. This is really important to this series. So I love that they, you know, give people was work. Like, Don't worry, I already have one. <laughs> <laughs> apparently <laughs> Jillian Anderson was super pleased with that scene saying I happened to be in really good shape at the time and was just raining to get in there and take those half naked nurses out with some karate chops <laughs> it's like hell yeah Jillian Anderson get it fucking done but David Duchovny not as happy about it when he read this script and saw that he was directed to be impressed with Scully's karate skills he, his literal response was I have no arms I've lost my arms why would I care about Scully's karate <laughs> <laughs> I can't do karate anymore <laughs> and I like that that middle place where they ended up where he seems like shocked and it, it, it seems like he's in a state of shock. Both like, why can Scully do this karate? Also, I don't have any fucking arms. <laughs> I, I love that scene. I think it's great. And Dean Haglund, who plays Langley, the one with the long blonde hair, later called the sequence one of the greatest fight scenes ever, period. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. And like, it is a really good fight scene. I, I think it's very well executed. This episode was largely well-received. The biggest complaints were that it tries to do too much, but, like, 
that it's cyberpunk. It's it's both X Files and that cyberpunk. Like that's a big part of that like very specific genre. Is it's doing a fucking lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the whole goddamn like a deal. hacker building a kill switch that has like a dumb song on it. Like that's very cyberpunk. Just like let it exist. Yeah, exactly. I just I also love it when they play that song. Yeah, I, and I, while they're escaping and that music is playing. Yes, like, and like I like it when they play it in the car and like the lights are all flashing. Yeah. I just think it's such a great detail. Also, that X Files crack video that we watched, the Twilight one of uh, Mulder and Luke Wilson, that's the song that they play over it. So I just have a special affinity to that. Kill Switch was such a frequent rerun episode that they brought back Gibson and Maddox to write a second X Files episode called First Person Shooter, which we are going to get to. <laughs> we are definitely going to get to that one. It's one of my favorite episodes. People shit over it all the time. Is that uh, our accident or is that our bondage episode? Yes. <laughs> Spoiler, sometime in the future we'll have a bondage episode. And you'll see why when we get to the first person shooter. That's also one of those like Scully is one of the most badass women alive episodes. Like she well, comes in and a- rescues his ass. <laughs> Spoiler, and you can take this out, but it will be an interesting back-to-back because that is a baby woman episode. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was one of the ones in the X-Files Crack episode of they played My Heart Will Go On and it's Scully holding the giant gun and you were like, that episode, I want to know what that is. That's what that episode <laughs> is. So I love that William Gibson and Maddox were like, you know what we love? Scully being a badass. <laughs> like two people You know writing... what we dream of? <laughs> it's a great example too of two people who watch the show and understand who this character is and are like, I'm going to write for this character who deserves this kind of treatment. Cyberpunk's dream of a leather-clad Scully. <laughs> Absolutely. That's how it be. That's just how it be sometimes. <laughs> Stops to showdown. Sure. All right. Mulder and Scully chase an AI with the help of a bitchy goth. Mulder does a Mulder and almost dies. The goth gets to live forever on the net with her dead boyfriend. The end. Or is it... A hot hacker battles for queen bitch supremacy while Mulder is stuck in a pornography nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! You nailed it. <laughs> Are you ready for a Deep Throat's mission log? Let's do it. Bah. Surprise. I see. Beginning with the Ultimate Computer, as Stell mentioned, this is the teleplay by DC Fontana, the story by Lawrence N. Wolf. This is directed by John Meredith Lucas, who was the show's producer for the second half of the second season, as well as directing and writing several other episodes. He was also the co-producer of Ben Casey and The Fugitive, two of the most popular television programs of the 60s. Later, he served as producer, writer, and director on many television series, including Insight, for which he received two Emmy nominations, and The Six Million Dollar Man. Old Bob Wesley, Robert Wesley. (laughs) Commodore. Commodore was named for a pseudonym that Gene Roddenberry had used in his early career. In fact, Wesley is Roddenberry's given middle name. We learn more about old Bob Wesley, Kirk's friend, question mark. Friend. In the animated series. You can be friends, but they definitely banged at least once. Yes. Yeah. I I mean, you could be friends with some of them. Bob. Bad. (laughs) I... (laughs) I I trusted Bob's morality. Uh, We learn more about what happens to Bob Wesley in an animated series episode, One of Our Planets is Missing, where Bob has retired from the Federation and becomes governor of Mantilles, a planet in the farthest reaches of the Federation. Speaking of what happened to the prominent person after this episode, more stuff on Daystrom. Daystrom is a huge figure in Trek lore. He was the inventor of the Comptronic and Duotronic computer systems and hailed as the Einstein of his time, winning the Nobel Prize at 24. His breakdown in this episode canonically doesn't actually lessen his reverence at all, as his Daystrom Institute and Daystrom Reward are often referenced throughout other Trek shows. The character of Daystrom appears in the novel The Rift by Peter David as one of several Federation scientists who accompany Kirk on an embassy to a recluse and advanced race, the Caligar. Daystrom confides that although many consider his intellect to be undiminished, his confidence has deserted him, making him incapable of any new ideas. In the epilogue of the novel, however, Daystrom combines observations of the Caligar's technology with his previous M5 research to produce the forerunner of the 24th century holodeck, which leads to the EMH. Cool. So, in a roundabout way, canonically, Daystrom does invent the computer doctor. That's great. That's cool. I like that a lot. I love extended lore like that. 
Also, I feel like that makes sense too. Like, b- scientists have breakdowns all the fucking time. Like that. People, people have breakdowns. Well, yeah, but I just mean like, working- aren't we all scientists in our own way? Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, and, and that doesn't. The breakdowns don't define you in the long span of your right, life right. and career. Yeah, his breakdown may have killed several people, but several, people several hundred people. Well, also, to be it's fair, terrible. like to be fair to Doctor Daystrom, like Starfleet wanted to do the war games, war games test, and when Daystrom was like, Daystrom was like, I don't know how to unplug this either. It's not like he yeah. was like, yes, he was like, don't do it, don't do it. But ultimately, like they did try and do it, and Daystrom was like. I don't know how to unplug this. So it's not yeah. like he was like, I know when I'm keeping it a secret. So it is kind of his fault, but it's also like 100% Starfleet's fault for being like, let's test it. Yeah. I mean, let's really. test it with 20 people on this ship and give it complete control. Yes. Yeah. Like when you read it through that line, it does become another story of the military. Yeah. Pushing yes. innovation too far, too fast, too soon. And helping to like, honestly accelerate this breakdown and you know my new head canon is he goes to that mental facility he gets like an actual break he gets to step away and like view everything in a more like you know he gets to step away from this project for the first time ever and have some actual like clarity i think and then- ultimately several hundred people had to die but it was good for him <laughs> i mean he comes back and he is still revered and still respected and still makes advancements Speaking of just further lore around that character, in an early draft of the TNG episode Booby Trap, the character, which later becomes LaForge's gross obsession, Leah Ugh. Brams, was instead to have the surname of Daystrom and was intended to be Daystrom's great great granddaughter. However, the casting department had already cast Susan Gibney as this character, who is white, oh. and they failed to connect the two and that they should hire a black actor for this. So at the suggestion of script coordinator Eric Stilwell, they've made her a person who studied at the Daystrom Institute, still kind of keeping that lineage in its own way. Also, it's really gross and the worst storyline. Yeah, that storyline is divisive. (laughs) Not good. We'll get into some casting stuff. Sean Morgan, who plays the red shirt Harper in this episode, also played Brenner in Bounce of Terror and O'Neill in Return of the Archons and the Tholian Web. That's Barry Russo as Wesley. He also appears in The Devil in the Dark as the character Lieutenant Commander Giotto. We talk more about him during our Horde of Love Fest, so check out season one for that. And that brings us to William Marshall as Richard Daystrom. Yeah. The joy of connecting Marshall from this episode to an historic Shakespearean career to the guy who played Blackula to the guy who played the king of cartoons in Pee Wee's Playhouse is exactly the reason why I love doing this <laughs> section of this podcast. What an interesting person and an amazing career. Among his many Broadway appearances, he understudied Boris Karloff as Captain Hook in Peter Pan in 1950. He played the <laughs> he played the leading role of Delaud in the 1951 revival of The Green Pastures. Stell mentioned he did extensive Shakespeare work in the U.S. and Europe. One of his Othellos is recorded on video, oh, his really? 1981 Othello. So we should, we should totally search yeah. that out and look for it. He also played Othello in a jazz musical version of the play called Catch My Soul, where Jerry Lee Lewis played Iago from 1968 wow. in Los Angeles. It I'm sounds but wild. It might be an absolute dumpster fire but i want to search that out as well it sounds really really interesting i'm literally looking up who is his iago and the other othello because i'm curious but 1981 okay as for his role as blackula these three white people aren't going to try to dissect the boons and banes of the cultural effect that black exploitation had but no one can deny that the character of blackula was one of its most iconic and long-lasting figures immediately recognizable mm-hmm. brought a lot of gravitas to that role shakespearean gravitas even so that makes all of the sense in the world his other film appearances include the alfred hitchcock hour tarzan man from uncle rosetti and ryan voicing tony stark and the juggernaut on spider-man and his amazing friends and the film adaptation of maverick He also won two local Emmys for producing and performing in a PBS production as Adam early in the morning. In addition to his acting and production work, Marshall taught at various universities, including University of California, Irvine, and the Mufati Institute. 
an African-American and arts music institution in the Watts section of Los Angeles. He did similar work at Chicago's Creative Arts Foundation, which in 1992 named Marshall as one of its epic men of the 20th centuries, which like, cool. yeah, yeah, epic fucking dude. Totally rules. Did you find anything? Yeah, it's a English actor named Ron Moody who is most famous for being Fagin and Oliver, but I'm not, uh, he, I, I'm unfamiliar with him, so I'm sure he was fine. I'm sure he was fine. <laughs> we should still check it out. Fagin you is have a to pretty have, big villain, so yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you have to have a good Iago, so we'll see. We'll watch it. <laughs> Moving on to Kill Switch, as Aaron mentioned, this was written by William Gibson and Tom Maddox. A great entry into Gibson's work is Neuromancer, mm -hmm. and his preceding short stories were also really, really good. The father of cyberpunk, like Aaron yeah. said. He's also the writer of 1995's Johnny Mnemonic, starring Keanu Reeves, Henry Rollins, Ice-T. It's a fun movie. <laughs> it's very interesting, very Pause. cyberpunk. There's cyber dolphins who work as servers there's outlandish costumes keanu reeves has like a hard drive in his head that has too much data in it so it's it's an interesting movie i like it a lot it's also a fucking killer pinball table <laughs> this was directed by you could have guessed it rob bowman he seems to have done almost every episode we've done so far this season this was also edited by Heather McDougal, who won an Emmy for Best Single Camera Editing for this episode. I mean, it's really well edited. They, yeah. She does a great job. And it took a while to shoot, apparently. Yeah. So, like, she put in the work for it, definitely. Moving on to some lore and fan stuff. It's kind of a throwaway line, but when Invisigoth is laying down her resume, she throws out that she was headhunted to Kobayashi. Of course, this could be a reference to Kobayashi Maru, the computer program in the Star Trek Institute that was supposed to be completely impossible to solve, kind of alluding to her fate and the fate of anyone who would go against this computer program. Not Death. sure if that's <laughs> not sure if that's exactly the reason why, but you know. Oh, I bet it is. Yeah. If it's Gibson and Maddox, I'm almost positive they did that on purpose. That makes a lot of sense. Aaron mentioned that 3D model that was made for Dana Scully for that brief fluxing sequence inside the computer program. The producers requested kind of more of like a wireframe-ish model to make it look more of the time. However, that freelance person that they sought out to do it turned out a fully 3D naked Dana Scully model. Of course. <laughs> I knew and it. then they put clothing on. Yeah, I think <laughs> still, still intonated that earlier and I wanted to follow through on it. The swoosh sound effect used in this episode for the orbital laser weapons is a famous and well-used stock sound. It is the shoulder-mounted missiles in the Predator movie and also can be heard in the Doom video game. A scene of this episode can be heard playing in the background in one scene of the season three millennium episode, Human Essence. So I guess drink the whole episode. <laughs> drink, 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 corn, corn. <laughs> Also notable in Nerds Also Made More Things You Like, the band Killswitch Engage takes their name from this episode. I remember Killswitch Engage from being a metalhead in the early aughts and buying a few of their t-shirts actually from Hot Topic. <laughs> but the other people sitting at this table will know Killswitch Engage of writing and performing This Fire Burns, CM Punk's original theme in WWE. Ah, Interesting. What a small world. <laughs> Everything nerds. is wrestling. <laughs> Everything is wrestling. Nerds, Everything nerds, is nerds. nerds. Moving on to some casting stuff. We see Dan Weber as Charles Figgis. He was also in the Millennium episode, Goodbye Charlie. Ted Cole, we see listed here as paramedic number two. It's a small and unassuming part here in Mulder's dream transition into the computer program, but Cole is actually a huge anime English dub voiceover artist. Did a lot of work in the Gundam series, Ranma One Half, Project Arms, Death Note, and most notably is Android 17 and Yamcha in like any and all English dub Dragon Ball anything. Live action, he recently guested on Batwoman and did two episodes of Supernatural. Season 5, episode 3 is Free to Be You and Me, he played the coroner. And season 14, episode 9, he plays a partygoer in The Spear. I'm still in 10. Yeah. I'll get there eventually. I'm stuck in 10. Mark of Cain. That's Jerry Schramm as Gerald Boyce. We saw him previously as Lerald Rebhun. No. In the two-part mythology arc episodes, Tempest Fugit and Max. 
He also had a return role on One Life to Live and played Duke in Insidious. That is Patrick Keating as Donald Gelman. We've already seen him on this show as the beggar in Kitten and also does a couple of episodes of Millennium. Check out our first season episode on Kitten for more on him. But if I didn't talk about him there to the extent that you would have liked, you could also subscribe to our Patreon to see all of our episode notes with more extensive casting notes that I don't mention on this show here there. I also, never would have noticed that was the same person. Never. That's that's funny. Also, should you be missing Skinner, you should just go watch Kitten, I guess, because apparently Skinner's dead and doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it will come back. Sure, sure, sure. I'll believe it when I see him. See his big, beautiful face. <laughs> With the episode's gangster montage opening, we briefly see Jackson, and that's played by Peter Williams. Peter Williams is the brother of Stephen Williams, who plays X, and also is probably best known for his role as the Gua'uld system lord Apophis in Stargate SG-1. He also has return roles on Neon Rider, Hurricane, Da Vinci's Inquest, Dead Like Me, and a recent guest role on The Expanse. I love that show. <laughs> I love The Expanse as well. That's Kate Luibin as Nurse Nancy. She is also in the Millennium Episodes pilot and 13 Year Later. Also, Fifi in Shanghai Noon, as well as guest roles on Dark Angel, 40-Year-Old Version, Femme Patals as Crazy Mary Mason, and has a child with comedian Jim Jeffries. I hope they're good. Dating a comedian oh. is... Weird and rough. They're divorced. <laughs> They're divorced. Oh, yeah. I really like Jim Jeffries. He's great because he talks about how, like, they got divorced and he was like, yeah, I just bought her a house because, like, she should have a house because she dealt with me and she had a kid with me and, like, we've got and a co-parent. I am insufferable. Yeah, he's like, you, you know, you'll, you'll be good over there. I'll pay for whatever you fucking want. I didn't know that was her. That's funny. Fantastic. Yeah. I think that is... <laughs> That is possibly one of the best ways to end a relationship with a comedian, especially yes. a famous one. Yeah. They buy you a house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he seems like a legit dude. He seems to have um, pretty good self-awareness. He's like, yeah, I'm a comedian. It's hard to deal with me. Yeah. I got famous doing a gun control joke. Right. Which brings us to Kristen Lehman as Esther Nairn slash Invisigoth. Invisigoth. Kristen was a trained ballet dancer at Canada's Royal Academy of Dance and then suffered an ankle injury at 17, so transitioned into acting and did so very successfully. From starring in recurring roles to Jordan on Kung Fu The Legend Continues, Kristen Adams on Poltergeist The Legacy, Avery Swanson on Felicity, Lily on Judging Amy, Shira in the Chronicles of Riddick movie, Gwen Eaton on The Killing, Angie Flynn on Motive, and most notably to a, probably most people listening to the show, played Miriam Bancroft on the first season of Altered Carbon. While also getting directing credits on Motive, The Order, and the new Nancy Drew reboot TV show. She also recently guested on Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone reboot as the therapist character in Meet in the Middle. A notable quote from her is, you have to carry so many archetypes as an actor, especially as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed one. Good for her. <laughs> She's not wrong. With big old lips. <laughs> yes. I, like... I watched Alter Carbon is another like super cyberpunk esque series. Yeah, she's you... got that vibe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but she plays like a very prim, proper, well to do character in that, and I did not connect the two at all That's after cool. seeing this for years because of how effective her makeup and shit is in this episode. Yeah, acting. also acting. acting. Also, yes, very good at acting. <laughs> oh, call my doctor. You have to call my doctor. Call Doctor Scully. And now it's time for our overall thoughts. So each episode dealt with machines. I don't know. You usually throw this over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is about AI and the way that AI protects itself. Like, ultimately, that's what both of these episodes are about. Because like, if you program something to be more human, it's going to want to protect itself. Right. Like, the most human instinct is to survive and the most live like if something is alive yes. their instinct is to survive because even if you're an animal or like you right. know a plant like your instinct is to live is right. to survive exactly and so i think both of these episodes grapple really well with this 30 years apart of what we view as ai with a computer at the time in the 60s and what we view as ai with the internet in the 90s like these are both really good representations of our fear about what will happen with AI and how we as humans have to learn how to grapple with that. And like, what is the greater good of AI and how do we learn to live 
harmoniously and simultaneously with it. So I think these are really great to pair together. I think that these, you know, very good at podcast meetings. That's, <laughs> but also, like, that's the way. <laughs> the idea of these creators, too. Creators yes. making something that they can no longer control. Like yes. the idea of Donald whatever is fuck and Esther Invisigoth whatever <laughs> and Dr. Richard Daystrom being like, I created this thing. I'm a genius, but I can no longer control this. Yes. This is beyond me now. And the idea too like Invisigoth talks about like well the AI isn't going to just hit Donald with a particle beam it wants to impress it like the computer sort of does the same thing with Daystrom where it's like I'm part of you and like you taught me about morality and so I'm going to push forward with this idea of morality too so it's again like if you make an AI more human like and you base it after yourself like it's kind of the worst parts of your personality allowed to run free in the primordial ooze and like these are both very good examples of that yeah absolutely as a casual fan would you recommend this episode to a newbie absolutely 100 percent. So good. you could drop in on this episode with no other context whatsoever about star trek like it's you get a lot of like i said the introspection of the crew and especially of kirk and like the interactions that the crew has together and the way that they deal with the idea of kirk becoming redundant they're not even upset about their own jobs and being redundant. It's the idea of the loyalty that they feel to this captain and how they feel about him being made a joke and being made redundant. So I really like that. And also you get like great Shakespeare in space. You get this like grappling with humanity and what have I created and am I the baddie? Like, yeah, I just think it's a really, really effective episode. So it's, yeah, I would recommend this to anybody. It's a very timeless story, but it's also a, timeless story in terms of technology like you said earlier like this idea of like machines replacing man is still something that we grapple with yes, today absolutely you kind of talked about this earlier but would yeah, you i don't think this? i would yeah. i think i think that if again this is a caveat like this is an episode that you can watch and i don't think it would turn you off on the x-files and i think that you would get some enjoyment on it because it's like it's very interesting and visually mm -hmm. stimulating it has like cool concepts but I think you would get a lot more enjoyment from it. Because I feel like if you just dropped in on this, you'd be like, what is this weird porno nightmare and his arms yes. are chopped <laughs> off? And like, she's karate now. And like, why is she just shooting at everything? I feel like it really, it's really a better experience if you know what's going on, yeah. even a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. What is a scene or moment from this episode that you won't forget? I think, honestly, Kirk grappling with is it just me? Is this computer... The hallway scene with yeah. me and McCoy. Is, it, is this bad? Am I? Is my intuition wrong because I just don't want to be replaced? Like that... I just really liked that scene and I thought it was really impactful of actually grappling with, I don't know if my instinct is wrong. Ultimately, I don't want to be replaced, but is that a bad thing? Like, I just really liked that. I thought it was very good. What's a scene that you'll remember? I mean, there's a lot to choose from inside this episode. Scully blindly shooting a battle bot. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It's her, she pops up and is like, fuck that. And then just like, <laughs> <laughs> just like side arms. <laughs> it. yeah. It's really good. That's a great answer. <laughs> it's really good. Who are you shipping in this episode? McSpurg, duh. Yeah. I'm gassing up their captain and then him being like, there's my boys flirting into elevator again. Here we go. Space laughter. <laughs> Are you shipping anyone in this episode? It is a one-sided ship for Mulder to Scully. <laughs> Scully's like, nope, I don't care about any of this. I just want to get this bitch out of my car and get save Mulder. But I'm like, Mulder is subconsciously like, I am very much in love with this woman. Yes. So it is a, it is an unrequited love ship at this, in, at this moment. Yes. I mean, she does risk it all to get him out of that trailer, though, and yeah, drags like, his bitch ass out of it. <laughs> that just feels like another day in the office for Dana Scully. <laughs> <laughs> Not wrong. This is episode of Fuck, Finer, Flop. This is a fuck, for sure. Is I this... think this would be a fuck, too. Yeah. Yeah, they're good episodes. Yeah, these are both really good episodes. And I also feel like pairing them together elevates both of them. Agreed. Like, they, they just fit so well together inside of this theme that, like, it makes me like both of these episodes more. Yay. Yay. All right. You can find us on the internet. You can follow us at NYD Productions on Twitter, and you can interact with us using the hashtag XTrexPod. You can find me at NYD Urgency on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter at Stella underscore Cheeks. You can find me on Twitter retweeting BattleBots clips at <laughs> Haberdasher9K. You can also follow us on Instagram at NYD Productions, and you can email us at 
xtrexpod at gmail.com with questions or comments. This is usually where I make a joke about fic, but honestly, I just want to read the fluffiest fluff, fluff, fluff Mixburg fics after that. They're so cute. Oh, my God. I love them. I have a lot of links should you need them. <laughs> and if you want more special behind the scenes action, like our insane script notes, <laughs> lengthy episode outtakes, extra podcasts like unofficial channels and access to our newly minted NYD Productions Discord, then check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash NYD Productions, where you can get access to all that and more for, for only a dollar. dollar. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to tell your friends. We find this nerdy shit is better when it's shared. We'll see you next time for the family drama episode. In the meantime, believe boldly, seek truth, ship proudly. Extracts is created and written by Stella Cheeks, Aaron Klein, and Bobby Hoffman, and produced by Bobby Hoffman for NYD Productions. Our show theme is Alien Spy by Ionix, and our show art was made by Jonathan Curtis. You've had a singular honor conferred on you, Jim. You're going to be the fox in the hunt. What's that? War games. War games! You program the autonomous bots in Ninjutsu Princess. The most gnarliest piece of entertainment software ever.